Can we go over the difference between um, sparse and combinatorial coding? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, essentially, um, it's whether whatever dimension of whatever whatever uh, organization of things that you're looking at is encoded by one neuron or by a combination of neurons. Um, and so we talked about in the context of the olfactory system um, where uh, we could have some situation where we've got series just six glomeruli and then um, apple activates these two and banana activates these two and so um, then over in the olfactory cortex um, there's one cell that is a banana cell that's getting convergent in for both of these and then some other cell that is an apple cell getting convergent over both of these. Um, and meanwhile, there's also some inhibitory neurons that are making, uh, getting input from everybody and sort of making outputs onto everybody. Um, and if you set the synaptic weights just right in a situation like this, then um, if any one of these, if one, if, if this cell's active, first of all, if this cell's active, you don't know whether it's going out or not. Second of all, if one or the other of these is active, then that apple cell isn't going to go. Um, but if both of them are active together, then that one will. And so, um, the only way that you're going to figure out what you're smelling, if you're looking at the olfactory bulb, is by the combination of, of who's active. Whereas, if I want to know whether I'm smelling an apple or a banana, um, individual neurons uh, carry this sort of information. Um, so in that sense, we sort of say that this, this would be sparse, but more precisely, maybe sparse for for um, simple odors. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> maybe there's some other cell here that's a cinnamon cell, and some other cell here that's a clove cell, and on and on and on. Um, and um, maybe in the next area down from the brain, next area down in sensory processing, in um, Interrhinal cortex or something. Um, there's some cell here that gets convergent input of this that codes for grandma's apple pie. It only gets active when all of those simple odors are active. And so, in that sense, grandma's apple pie is encoded in combination here, but then by sparse individual neurons over here. And maybe there's different synaptic weight, and there's another nearby neuron that maybe. Uh, maybe my grandma's apple pie recipe is a little bit different from Eden Park's apple pie recipe, and so there's a different neuron that codes for Eden Pie's apple pie recipe over in this next area. <clears throat> um, and similarly, with the visual system, in your retina, in your LGN, everything is encoded in spots. In your primary visual cortex, things are encoded in lines. So if I'm interested in finding a line in the world, I need a combination of LGN cells to find that line. Um, and then in um, higher visual areas, maybe my grandma's face is coded by a single cell. And the lines that make up, and, and so if I want to know it be one, whether I'm looking at my grandma's face, no one cell is going to tell me that, but some combination of lines is going to tell me that. So um, a combinatorial code, I guess, would be one where whatever, you're, whatever feature you're interested in is not encoded in individual neurons, but in the combination of neurons. And then a sparse code is one where individual neurons will be able to answer the question you're interested in about am I smelling apple versus banana. Uh, if you're interested in am I smelling apple pie versus, um, uh, versus um, uh, fresh picked apples, then maybe you need to go to the next cortex, next level of cortex to figure that out. Um, 
So is it combinatorial, like in, if we're focusing on olfaction, like the glomeruli are like sparse and or it could be sparse or it could be well, the, the glomeri an individual glomerulus at best encodes some sort of chemical fingerprint. Okay. So, so is it more combinatorial in yeah. like when you combine like individual glomeruli into like a into yeah. an odor? I mean, people rarely, rarely would talk about sparse coding or, or real like meaning within the glomeruli. Um, but I think if you sort of press people, they would say, yeah, individual chemical fingerprints are encoded by individual glomeruli in the, in the olfactory bulb. Um, just the spots of light are encoded in the retina. Um, but, um, but when you're interested in um, something that is made up of a combination of multiple chemicals, then you're going to have to get a piriform cortex. And when you're interested in something that's made up of a more complex mix, then you might have to even go to higher levels. So, but yeah, to make, so, so it's, I mean, it's sort of in relation to the question that you're asking or in relation to the, the so, it, you know, if I want to know, is there a benzene ring somewhere in the, um, in the smell, in the combination of smells, then maybe that is present in just like one or two of them. Um, so, yeah, did that kind of help? Yeah, I guess um, I was mainly focusing on this question because on the sample final, the <coughs> first question asking about like um, the different higher order thalamic nuclei. Yeah. I was trying to think of a way to relate why there isn't a higher order thalamic nucleus for audition back to yeah. like the organization of like the set like the sensory organs and like their projections. So, like, yeah. I couldn't really think of a connection. Um, I mean, yeah, that's. I, so, um, I mean, the, yeah, the 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 questions because of the open book nature and the fact that we spent we've gone on a lot of topics are pretty broad. There's not necessarily one right answer to that. Um, I do like so in addition to I mean, sort of the, or maybe even the more extreme case is in olfaction. There's no thalamic, not even first order thalamic, the second one. Um, so maybe so what is it? Can, can, can we say, okay, well, maybe sound, vision is, mi is, is many dimensions to it. There's sort of two dimensions of the retinal visual world, the retinal projection, but on top of that, there's color and brightness and, um, and maybe contrast, although that might sort of fall out of brightness. Um, so there's, there's many different sort of dimensions along which you can think about vision. And so it sort of makes sense that there's a lot of different processing. Um, somatic sensation, Immediate is a sort of, is sort of less obviously multidimensional at first, but then when you start thinking about the fact that we have ten different kinds of pain receptors, five different kinds of touch receptors, um, all for different, and, and then and then there's also everything's organized along our body. Um, there is a lot of multidimensional space going on there. Um, <clears throat> sound. I would almost think that's yeah. simpler because it's just like you're just detecting like where on the cochlea you're getting. So it's like, I don't necessarily know if like feedback like into a higher order thalamic nucleus is gonna tell you much about. Yeah, it might not. And, and, and I don't have, I mean actually that question and, there, and, and others like it that you might see on the final might be something that I don't have a great answer to necessarily. Um, and so it's really a challenge for you to sort of think about what are the issues, what's the data that we have and what can we draw on. Okay. Um, and so I and so I like so so yeah. Sound is in, in, in a sense sort of unidimensional at least in terms of input, right? As opposed to vision, which has two dimensional input projected onto the retina, um, two different eyes that you're comparing, color and brightness. So that's a lot of different dimensions that you're dealing with. Um, touch, multiple different sensors all mapped onto a body. A lot of different dimensions there. The input for uh, for auditory system is is sort of frequencies, right? Um, now, there is processing that goes on from those frequencies, some of which we've talked about ju that, that just the first order of the lambda nucleus and the cortex can do together. Um, but maybe the higher cortical areas involved in auditory system just don't need a thalamic partner to help them because the incoming information is, is at first sort of in a simpler form. Um, I think that's a great way to approach that question. And then your idea about, okay, so olfaction, um, again, it's, it's hard to say how many dimensions you want to be thinking about with olfaction. Um, 
Uh, you could think of it as, as a thousand dimensional space where the, the intensity of each glomerulus is, um, is that. Um, but, um, or you could think of it as, um, as sort of just a, a sort of temporal stream of chemistry coming into your nose. That in that sense is sort of a lineup of molecules that are sort of hitting your nose one at a time. Um, there's obviously a few combinations of molecules, but it, but just you know maybe like there are combinations of tones in the auditory system, and so um, I mean that that is the is is I think the beginnings of an answer that could easily be like a full credit like greatly well thought out sort of like okay there's th this is why vision and somatic sensation are so much more complex than an auditory system. Um, and as an extreme example, a faction doesn't use the thalamus at all um, and still gets the job done um, because it is also not sort of multidimensional in the same way as somatic sensation and vision. Um, and so drawing from all of that together um, is, is sort of exactly the kind of synthesis that I'd be hoping for on the exam. Um, and that's not the only way to answer that question. Um, uh, there um, may be... And for example, another answer to that question might be that while there is no second order thalamic nucleus, there is some cortical area, you know, like a lot of the stuff anterior, which we didn't actually talk about so much in this class, but a lot of the stuff anterior to primary auditory cortex is very poorly understood. But it does interconnect some with auditory cortex. And so maybe there's something that functions like a second order thalamic nucleus, it's just buried in cortex here. Um, that would be that would be another way to um, to uh, approach that. Maybe a little harder to find data behind it, but um, uh, but um, you could I guess argue for the the necessity first of a second order nucleus order to process things, and then say that job has to get done somewhere. Um, and so uh, it'll it it could be in an unknown area that's that's either another part of cortex or just not or just some part of uh, it's some deep brain structure that we haven't worked out the function of. It's doesn't it's functionally like the thalamus, but not actually in the thalamus, for example. Um, yeah, this, it's it's a. I mean, the, by definition, they're not easy questions on the yeah. marginal exam. <laughs> so, other questions, either about that or about other topics. I'm going over the discrete uh, from unit one, the discrete uh, energy levels of photons. <coughs> um, yeah, sure. So, um, I think maybe the that. Oh, yeah, let's see. Where it's going to be? I think the, well, the first my first thought for the best visual for this is just going to be in, in, in the exam. So we're going to that. Um, So, an idealized electron um, will have distinct states that it is allowed to be at. And that's actually where the quantum and quantum mechanics comes from. In a lot of ways, quantum mechanics is actually kind of continuous, but there are ways in which it's discrete, and one of the ways in which it's discrete is that um, particles are only allowed to be in certain discrete um, maybe there are very many discrete states that a particle can be in, um, but there's only certain discrete states that a particle can be in. Um, and so, um, in reality, well, let's back up a little bit more than that. So, um, when we're talking about um, so this one, actually, back here on this one, some people got a little bit of the logic mixed up on this. Um, so, if you want to have if you have an electron and you want a photon to get absorbed by it, then the energy for this, for wherever the electron is to one of its higher allowed states needs to exactly equal the energy of the photon. 
Um, and so, and then, uh, and then from that, you can, since H and C are universal constants, um, and X is, um, is also some, some universal constants involving the mass of the electron and a few other things um, that we're not concerned about with this, um, uh, you end up with that, um, that um, E transition equals E photon, um, so therefore um, some constants over L squared equals um, uh, some more constants over the wavelength of the photon, uh, and so um, uh, we could flip this over and say L squared equals lambda over x times h times c, um, and so these are uh, the the the, um, the wavelength of the photon is proportional to the um, uh, the the wavelength of the. Oh, I think I did that right. You know, maybe. Anyway, some stuff over here times x over h c. Um, so, um, but this is all this is all constants as far as we're concerned. Um, and so, um, and so the um, and and so depending on how well how tightly constrained the electron is, if it's in a tight little box, then we need um, a smaller wavelength, which means a higher energy photon. Um, so uh, and so and so, like I said, electrons are only allowed to exist in certain states. If um, actually, there's a video uh, that I could link to people wanting you to search for like why is glass transparent. The channel is 60 symbols, um, and essentially what it comes down to is that visible wavelengths of light do not um, all fall into this band for the electrons in glass, all fall into sort of this space. So any visible wavelength of light that tries to bump into an electron in a, mole, in, 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 in a chunk of glass is going to essentially pass right through. It might get diffracted around a little bit, and that's a more complicated story that I don't even fully understand, but it happens. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't get fully absorbed because um, there's not uh, because none of the electrons in glass can accept that wavelength, those wavelengths of light, that, that band of wavelengths that we're able to see. Um, and so in an ideal situation um, where everything is standing completely still, these are perfectly discrete values. The electron has a, has a well-defined energy at the ground state um, that has no, no wiggle to it, um, well-defined first excited state, second excited state, and so on and so forth. Um, and so if I want to um, activate this electron um, and excite it, then I need to hit it with exactly the right wavelength of light. Does that make sense so far? What if, what if you, so like um, in A, yeah. you are asking if, it's, if you try to excite it with a photon with a wavelength that's insufficient to get it to the first excited state, so you wouldn't see anything, like it would be like passing. Yeah, through, actually right? in A, the wavelength, since energy is inversely oh, proportional right, right, right. to wavelength, the 570 gets us right in between here. So, yeah, okay, so that was actually my question. It's just like, if you're in between the excited states, like... It still doesn't happen. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Okay. Yeah. Just passes right by. Um... So, uh, yeah, and so um, there's, there's a couple caveats to this. One caveat to this is that in reality, things are, in biology, things are always at 37 degrees Celsius, which is pretty warm. So things are already just sort of constantly jiggling around, which means that we're constantly sort of expanding and contracting the box that contains this one particular excitable electron that we're interested in, whether we're going to excite. And that's why, in reality, you get something like this, where um, there's an optimal wavelength to excite an electron, um, but, some time, but, but there's, a su there's some probability that a shorter, um, wave, a shorter photon with higher energy will excite it, because maybe um, at some instant in time, the box will be tightly, the, the, the molecule that contains the crow for will be sort of jiggled down a little bit, and then uh, a nanosecond later, it might jiggle open a little bit, and then if you happen to catch it at that nanosecond with a photon that's, that's got a longer wavelength and less energy, then that would excite your, your, um, your photon. Sorry, excite your electron. 
Um, and so your photon gets absorbed. Um, and then once the photon gets absorbed, it can do a few different things. Um, really kind of one and a half that we care about. Um, uh, so it can, it can just heat up the system. Um, it can um, break or twist bonds or do chemistry, and that's the one that we're most interested in, where cis retinol is converted to trans retinol, which is how um, channel rhodopsin and all of its variants work, as well as rhodopsin in your eye work um, by this photon getting absorbed, and then twisting a bond so that now the G protein um, in the case of rhodopsin gets active, or the channel in the case of channel rhodopsin gets pushed open. Um, the same way that a chemical, an external chemical like glutamate can bind to a channel and twist it open, something that's already in there, if it changes shape, can twist the channel and make it open. Or can, cause a G protein to become active. Um, so, uh, and, and then also, in addition to this thermal jiggling around, we can systematically alter the, the environment around our molecule to make it more tightly or more loosely constraining the electron. And depending on if you make it more tightly constraining, then that's going to blue shift, make it so that we need bluer, higher energy photons to activate it. Um, if it's uh, if we more loosely constrained, then it's going to redshift. Need rather less energetic photons to activate it. Um, the other thing, in addition to chemistry and altering chemical bonds, that um, that uh, this can do is um, once you excite an electron, sometimes it drops down a little bit and then drops down again. It sort of can release that energy as two different photons, as one that's like microwave or, or radio wave, some very uh, low energy photon and then another visible photon. And so what can happen is I can hit, um, if I have the right molecule, I can hit it with a blue light and then what comes off is a microwave photon or a radio wave photon that I can't see or detect and then a green photon that has the remaining energy. And if that happens, then that's what we call fluorescence where I activate with blue light and instead of either absorbing the blue light or reflecting blue belt back at me, which is what most things do, it, um, some of those photons get absorbed and then get put back, not, and, then, and then get sent back not as blue, but as green. And so that's how green fluorescent protein and m which is a red fluorescent protein, and all of these fluorescent tags that we talked a little bit about, and it's one of the many tools that you have for genetically identifying cells and, um, and looking at their shape and their morphology in a living animal, or getting so that you can record, so that you can put an electrode in exactly the type of cell that you're interested in, in a living animal, um, or whatever you want to do. Um, so, so uh, yeah, um, that's, the, that's the other thing that we're sort of interested in that this, that this draws on. And again, the difference between green fluorescent protein and red fluorescent protein has to do with how tightly contained the chromophore is, or in some cases, what the um, what the fluorescent molecule embedded in the protein actually is, right? Sometimes it's a slightly different fluorescent molecule embedded inside the protein, but, but the ultimate difference comes down to the containment of the electron, how redshift and reshift it is. Other questions? Other questions about, again, either that or other topics? Yes? Could we just go over um, the spinal cord, like more so the stretch reflex part? Because I'm kind of confused, like how uh, it gets shut down to prevent damage. Ah, right, right, yeah. Um, so, well, I think maybe it was just easier for me to draw the whole thing. So the damage thing is something that um, rarely comes into play. It's sort of like the the ultimate protection against you being an idiot and destroying your arms. Um, so, spinal cord, and um, so here's um, some muscle. Could be my. I guess I'll show the quadriceps one. Um, well, yeah. So either either of these. So 
Yeah, so this is, the, I guess this will be the biceps. So this is, this is my biceps. And then here's some bone. And then on the other side is my triceps. And so um, if I contract the biceps and relax the triceps, then my arm bends. Or if something heavy comes onto my arm, then I need to contract my biceps further and relax my biceps. Either way. Um, and so inside this muscle um, are, um, are called spindle fibers. Um, and these are sensory organs, sensory endings, that wrap around some of the muscle fibers. And then these make an excitatory projection, and it's the only place in mammals that I'm aware of where you have a direct connection between a sensory neuron and a motor neuron with no interneurons in between. Um, and so this motor neuron here then excites the, the biceps muscle. So if some weight lands on my arm and my arm starts to move, then I tighten my biceps and keep, so I don't drop my coffee or whatever. Um, uh, or if the, I mean, you have the, you have the same sort of thing in your leg um, for, um, uh, I guess, I don't know. Well, sometimes I kind of play with my kids where I lay on my back and then I like put my legs up and then they like stand up on my on my calf. And so I guess um, if like the second kid jumped up on there or something unexpectedly, then I wouldn't want to drop them. And so that and that as that stretches, I want to sort of compensate. But actually, all your muscles have sort of com compensatory stretch reflex. Um, but in any case, um, you can fool this by um, by hitting your patellar tendon, which is relatively easy to find, and then that stretches the muscle, which activates this, and then you get. Um, and so that's one way doctors can do it. You can actually also hit your biceps tendon, but it's a little harder to find. The patellar tendon is usually the easiest to find. Um, and then there's also this branches <coughs> onto an inhibitory neuron, which then connects up to another motor neuron, um, and that motor neuron that motor neuron is exciting the triceps muscle, and so when my biceps is stretched, not only does the biceps contract a little bit, but the triceps also relaxes a little bit. And so that assists in that compensation for this. My arm has moved, so I want to relax this side and tighten this side, and that all kind of works together. Um, most muscles in your body, there's sort of um, uh, antagonistic relationships like biceps and triceps um, or hamstring and quadriceps where um, uh, uh, there's sort of competing sides and so you often will relax one while activating the other. Um, okay, and so then, but, but there's this, this sort of um, uh, coming off of the muscles um, are tendons, and um, and in fact, the tendons. So this would be actually, I guess, not connecting to the the uh, humerus, but to um, the tendons connect up to my um, uh, to my uh, to my radius. Um, and I and in some cases, if your tendons pull hard enough, and there's and if there's if there's enough weight here, so 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 as the weight goes up over here, the weight on this end, then if you want to keep everything static, you need more tension on the biceps, um, and then if you want to not have your arm go spinning out of the socket, then your humerus sort of by essentially Newton's second law automatically starts pushing down harder on your ulna. Um, and so here we're sort of treating the radius and ulna as, as, one, as one bone. They're actually two. Um, somebody corrected me after class that I made a mistake about. It, it wouldn't fracture, it would just dislocate. Uh, but you know, anyway, um, uh, in any case, um, as the weight's going up, if, we're gonna, if, I'm, if weight's getting piled on my arm here, 
if I'm going to keep my arm from falling up, down and dropping everything, then I've got to increase the tension, and then that causes an automatic increase in the force that my humerus is pushing down on this, which is what other, otherwise I would just sort of, this middle point here, my, it would just be spinning like a clock hand around that middle point. Um, if, it was just a, if it was just a free bar with no, with no third force point. Um, so if this is a single bone, then what would happen is as force builds up and up and up, it'll actually, it'll actually start to, to bend and bend and bend and bend at this point until it fractures. Um, in this case, actually, because the humerus is pushing down on the ulna and the biceps is pulling up on the radius, what would, what's going to happen is there's a point at which the tension here is so strong that the, the, that the um, uh, um, ligaments that connect the radius and the ulna would start to break, and the radius would become dislocated within your arm um, if your biceps muscle was pulling too strong. And in fact, um, for most people, for most healthy people, even if you don't spend much time at the gym, um, the maximum force that your biceps muscle can, ex can, can, can exert is sufficient to, would be sufficient to rip the radius away from the ulna. Um, and, uh, and so um, enough weight over here, and this compensation is going to cause you to dislocate your radius, which is bad. And so built into these tendons is a secondary sensor, um, which are called Golgi tendon organs. They have nothing to do with the Golgi apparatus, except that it's the same anatomist who discovered them. Um, and these Golgi tendon organs um, send their axons in, and they have sort of dinky little weak synapses onto an inhibitory interneuron here that goes onto this. So if this inhibitory interneuron fires, that's the, okay, drop it or you're going to break your arm signal. So whatever you're holding on to, you're, you're, you have to drop it or your arm is going to break. And so this is it's sort of a, a fail-safe built in. Um, because this synapse from the Golgi tendon organs to this interneuron is relatively weak, that means you need uh, a ton of action potentials, a lot of activity here. So this tendon has to be really, really um, being yanked to the point that it's practically dislocating your arm from itself in order to have enough action potentials that it's going to activate this interneuron and shut off the whole system. Yeah? Have there been studies where they like electrophysiologically fool it to like just like... Oh yeah, it? yeah, sure. You can, you can definitely um, uh, fool it. That's how we know that this exists, is that you can, is that you can act, if you activate these tendon organs strongly enough, then it will shut off, it will turn on this shut off. Um, yeah, there are also cases where people um, can uh, sort of override this um, with decent control and shut down and, 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 and can and have dislocated their arms um, by the force that they're exerting, um, uh, trying to like rescue a kid from a burning car or something like that. Um, it, uh, and uh, so, yeah, there, there are certain cases where you sort of override, or you can also override this. You can, you can consciously override this override system. Do the Golgi tendon organs, like, because you're talking about the, uh, like, the strong inhibitory neuron of, like, uh, of basically just, like, shutting down the bicep, do yeah. they also activate, like, an excitatory neuron to, like, Not extend the Not that I'm aware of. I think it's just a, it's just to relax everything. It's just okay. to, like, it's just like, okay, just, like, just, just stop. It's like, a, just, you're, you're gonna hurt yourself, just stop, kind of. It's how I think of it. I don't know for sure. Um, there is other, so these Golgi tendon organs, as well as, um, let's keep my colors somewhat consistent, as well as the, um, the spindle fibers do send ascending input up to your brain, and they provide knowledge about, even when you're not about to injure yourself, um, moderate amounts of action potentials or small amounts of action potentials in Golgi tendon organs are in informative to your brain about where your body parts are in space. And that's where sort of perception, proprioception, awareness of where our body is in space comes jointly from these two. 
Um, but in terms of a local reflex, the, the dominant local reflex is this compensatory reflex on the spindle fibers, um, but there's this secondary shutdown that the Golgi tendon organs provide because of the sort of physics of the situation. Um, that as you, as the weight increases, if we're keeping this arm steady, because I should point my arms, so keeping this arm steady as the weight's increasing, the tension has to go up and the force down has to go up, and that's going to cause something to rip apart or bend or something. How does the humerus exert a force down? That's it's it's um literally the same way that you know if I have this and then I double the mass on top of it, the table is exerting twice as much force up. It's just literally that um, that sort of you know the the harder as the tension is pulling up, the tendon is pulling up. Um, it's the the ulna is being pushed harder into the humerus, and so the humerus just like. Uh, Newton's second law ought, is, is automatically compensating. Yeah. That's, a, that's like passive physics. Or I don't know what the proper term for it is. It's Newton's second law. Third law. Uh, I'm sorry? Third law. Third law. Is it second law equal opposite reaction? Third. Okay, see? What's the second law? The second law first equals mass times acceleration? What's the first? Inertia. Inertia. Let's see. I said I was going to have all this physics in the class, and then I can't even keep it in the Thank you. Yeah? Um, can we go over the whole leg like, here, sitting and standing and blood pressure? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, let me get the. Um, uh, um, There it is, regulation This is one of the handful of circuits that's on the high end of confusion, although I think that the, the winner is definitely the basal ganglia circuit. Um, but, but this one's this one's up there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, so you've got your heart, and then coming out of your heart is your aorta. Um, and that's sending, um, and then there are branches of the aorta that go up to um, up to your head. And um, on the wall of the aorta, we have um, baroreceptors, which are stretch sensitive neurons. They're neurons that have stretch sensitive ion channels. Um, very much like the ones in the somatosensory system that we've talked about. Um, they use some of the same exact uh, sensory proteins that let sodium in as things stretch. And so every time your heart beats, these are stretching. Um, if I suddenly sit down or lay down, then um, there's less gravity pulling. Um, so the, your, your, the, the system is designed to keep your brain from having, to make sure the brain gets the right amount of blood. We don't want too much blood or too little blood going to your brain. Um, if there's, um, there are slower systems for m modulating blood pressure in your legs, but <clears throat> if for five seconds there's a little bit of extra blood pressure in your legs, or for five seconds there's a little bit less blood in your legs, that's okay. You're not gonna, you're not gonna pass out from that. Um, the, the, the concern, the, 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 the evolutionary priority is to keep um, is to keep the blood flow to your brain as constant as possible. <clears throat> so let's do the case where I lie down. I'm standing up and then I go lie down. So what happens is now there is less gravity pulling blood down that way. Um, or yeah, I think it's gravity sort of vectors turn 90 degrees and whatever. And so um, the bearer receptor, so when I lie down, 
then the bearer receptors increase their fire. Um, and then that sends an axon that goes up through the vagus nerve, which is the main, it's mostly um, a parasympathetic output nerve, um, but it also carries sensory input in, um, including this. Um, and so that makes an excitatory projection onto the nucleus of the solitary tract. Um, and then, uh, actually there's two parts of it, but whatever, we'll just sort of treat it as one thing. Um, and then that makes an excitatory projection onto another area called the nucleus ambiguous, um, I guess because when it was first discovered, nobody knew what it did. Um, and, then, um, and then that sends a projection out to um, parasympathetic ganglion, which I've drawn sort of schematically here as far away from the heart, but that's actually, turns out the parasympathetic nervous system, the, the, um, the uh, effectors, the, the, mo the, the motor things, or whatever, the, the, the final, the, the, the neurons that are actually releasing neurotransmitter right next to the cell. Um, and so the parasympathetic ganglion yeah, happens to be right by the heart. Actually, this goes back down the vagus nerve adjacent axons that are sort of oriented the other way. Um, and then that releases everything else so far um, has been um, green is glutamate. Um, that releases um, acetylcholine onto the heart. And then the acetylcholine has an inhibitory effect on the heart. Um, so, sort of the air conditioner example, when I lie down very suddenly, that, in, that get, all of a sudden, instead of thinking of it as more pressure, we can think of it as hot, as my head getting hotter. And so what we do is we turn down the AC, which is, wait, no, we turn down the, down the heat. Um, uh, so the parasympathetic nervous system, I guess, would be the heat here, which maybe is a poor analogy. Let's drop that, because... Never mind. Forget I said that. Um, you, you, this, you're con I guess the point I was trying to make, it's better to just make it directly, is that your sympathetic and parasympathetic are constantly active, and it's just a matter of like the balance of activity. There's never, ne neither one is ever totally off. So we're releasing, uh, you know, more glutamate, more glutamate, more glutamate, um, more acetylcholine, and then that acetylcholine is inhibitory. Increase acetylcholine leads to decrease of heart rate, and, and, and also and also the force with which your heart squeezes. Um, meanwhile, the nucleus of the solitary tract also connects up with the caudal VLM. I don't remember actually off the top of my head what VLM stands for, ventrolateral medial or something. Um, uh, nucleus of the spinal cord, um, and then the caudal VLM, actually, like this, caudal VLM is made up of GABA releasing neurons, which then release GABA onto the rostral VLM, which is um, excitatory and glutamate releasing, um, and then the rostral VLM. Um, releases glutamate onto another um, uh, interior meter lateral nucleus, or whatever that stands for. Um, and then that releases glutamate onto um, sympathetic ganglion. Um, and sympathetic ganglion, um, actually all of those cells um, live near the spinal cord. Although that little bit of anatomy is not something that you're going to get tested on. Um, and so then from near the spinal cord, the sympathetic ganglion releases a somewhat longer axon. Um, so it would be releasing norepinephrine. Um, and so norepinephrine itself normally increases the heart rate and, um, and pump volume. 
Um, but because there was an inhibitory thing in the middle of this, now that means less, less activity, less activity, less activity, less norepinephrine. Um, and so we get up again with turning down our heart rate. So those are the two pathways. Um, if I go from lying down to suddenly standing up, the world might go black for a half second, but then my blood pressure equalizes so that, my, so that I don't faint. Um, and the reason that that happens is that now um, the bearer receptors saw a decrease, and so everything happens in exactly the opposite of what I just laid out, um, ultimately leading to less acetylcholine and more norepinephrine um, in the case of suddenly standing up. But it's the same set of uh, structures. Does that help? Yeah. So going to lying down will cause more glutamate release onto the nucleus solitary tract. But like, yes. So but yeah. if you're standing up, it'll have less glutamate. Right. Okay. Because these are these sense pressure. Okay. Yeah. So these these um, these sense pressure. And um, there are a variety of ways to increase or decrease your blood pressure. Uh, but lie down is going to lead to an increase in blood pressure going to your head. Less going to your feet, but we care less about that. Um, and then uh, stand up is going to lead to a decrease in blood pressure going to your head. Um, that's just like the physics of the fluid sloshing around in your body. Um, and then. The whole rest of this is to is to compensate and undo what the passive physics of fluid is sloshing around. So 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 this is yeah yeah so this is um, this is like the this is the instantaneous, and then we have a whole bunch of stuff that in between here that ultimately means that we're going to have a decrease in blood pressure to compensate, and then a whole bunch of stuff maybe with the red arrow somewhere in here that's going to again lead to a decrease in blood pressure. Uh, or sorry, an increase in blood pressure here, um, so that we compensate for what what um, gravity does, I guess. So, yeah. But the curvature of space time. Okay. So I think I, I I don't know for sure, but I think that if you're low on blood, if, if if you're anemic, that means that you have less less red blood cells and therefore less hemoglobin and less oxygen per milli, uh, per like milliliter of blood or per volume unit of blood, and so <clears throat> um, to the extent that this is an imperfect correction, if this only gets most of the way corrected, um, then you might, as if you're anemic, you might be just getting enough oxygen to stay conscious. Um, and then um, either the delay is more, is, more, uh, is more noticeable or the compensation is imperfect, and either way, um, you are now, um, you're, you now sort of fall below some threshold of ne necessary oxygen to keep your brain going. Um, I used to hike, um, and there was a couple times that we went up some mountains in Colorado, and certainly standing up abruptly there would, would also cause problems. Um, there, it's actually because um, there's less, uh, the same, I still have the same amount of, of iron and hemoglobin, um, but just less, less oxygen being carried per unit of blood volume. Um, but so either, either way, um, to the extent that the compensation either falls short or has a delay to it, um, or even in that in that intervening few seconds before the compensation kicks in, was there, is there enough reserve oxygen to keep your your brain going um, uh, at full speed um, or not uh, to, before the compensation? Yeah, sure. Um, what for the pain reflex? Is the only like um, what is it called? Like the cell that matters to alpha beta myelinated axons, or were there other pain like axons? Um, so the A for the delta yeah. for the pain reflux. Um, so, um, yeah, the sensors here 
are not uh, muscle sensors. These are fast pain sensors. And um, slide somewhere. Um, this. So your thin, unmyelinated C fibers are the ones that are super slow, and it takes a second for the signal to get to your nervous system. Um, the A delta um, are the um, are the sharp pain that are lightly myelinated and travel about 10 to 20 times as fast. So instead of taking a second for a signal to get there, it takes a tenth of a second, say, for the signal to get there. Um, and then A gamma fibers are actually a class of motor neurons. Um, so, uh, but we didn't know that when we were first classifying these by their size. Um, a beta fibers are touch and vibration, and then A alpha fibers are proprioceptive fibers. And I don't remember, I think B fibers are autonomic fibers. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so the sensor bringing in, the, the fact that you just stepped on a thumbtack, that's the A delta or the sensor bringing in the information that you just um, uh, uh, touched hot stove is the A delta sensor. Uh, and then, <clears throat> um, and then uh, it turns out that on one side, uh, so there's, there's an, an excitatory and inhibitory interneuron. The excitatory interneuron um, contracts, so I step on, step on the thumbtack, the excitatory interneuron contracts, my hamstring muscle, um, the inhibitory neuron will, um, will relax and decrease the rate of uh, action potentials coming out of this motor neuron that connects to my quad, and so my leg does this. Um, but in order to keep from falling over, I also need to plant more firmly my other leg, um, otherwise I would, I would lose my balance. And so there's a, what's called a commissural neuron, um, which was just a name for a neuron that crosses the midline. And that commissural neuron then does the opposite. It's going to inhibit my hamstring and tighten my quadricep to plant my other leg more firmly on the ground. Um, and then we talked about how you could take some architecture like this and create some neuron uh, that uh, sort of alternates between activating this pattern on one side while this pattern on the other, and then switches to activating this pattern uh, to activate the, the inverse pattern on this side and then the inverse pattern on this side to make a central pattern generator. Um, and there are actually multiple ways. So you should definitely remember, like on the one, uh, just on one side, how to make a central pattern generator. Um, there are actually multiple possible solutions, and it's much better worked out for simple organisms like leeches and lampreys and things. Um, what the bilateral central pattern generators are like than it is for mammals. Um, it's more hypothetical. Um, so, but, but we came up with a few different hypotheses in class um, about the bilateral central pattern generators. Um, okay. uh, yeah. I guess I should say, James, did you have a follow up on this? Or? No. Okay, yeah. Um, so, look, can you can go over like, the, relation, the relationship between uh, the Purkinje cells and the granule cells of the cerebellum? Yeah, um, so it's um, the granule cells are by far the most numerous cells in your brain. They basically have to be because they make up almost 50% of the cells in your entire the entire, the entire central nervous system. Um, so, um, and so they are getting, there's a lot of divergent input from the pons and the cuneate and Clark and vestibular system. Um, cuneate and Clark are proprioception, vestibular is balance, and then the pons is sensory, motor, cognition, everything you think or do or consider doing, some copy of that is sent to the pons and then ultimately to granule cells. Um, and so there's big divergence to get out to those granule cells and then the granule cells all converge onto the Purkinje cell. So a particular granule cell might have between two and four synaptic inputs total, which is maybe the smallest anywhere in the nervous system. Trying to think. No, there are some bipolar cells in the retina that get input from just one cone, but they're close. Um, so, uh, um, so yeah. It's, um, and so, but they they sort of they sort of do things rather than having each neuron computing many things. They're sort of they're sort of the definition of specialist neurons in a sense. 
Um, but, um, but then the granule cells project up, and then their axons take a 90 degree turn. And then the Purkinje cells have these huge elaborate dendritic trees that um, are mostly in a plane. And so the granule cell axons run through those and make synaptic contacts as they pass through. And so a given Purkinje cell might be collecting information from a few hundred thousand to maybe up to a million granule cells um, that a particular Purkinje cell. And so, um, what that really means is not terribly clear. Um, but um, so we've got all sorts of inputs coming into our gray cells. Uh, our Purkinje cell makes an inhibitory output into onto cells that are called deep cerebellar nucleus cells. And then these cells excite VLC in the thalamus, which ultimately projects up to primary motor cortex. And then there's this one other structure, which is the, the olive. And the cells in the olive have a one-to-one -one connection onto Purkinje cells, where they're also excitatory and release glutamate, but sort of the polar opposite of granule cells. Each individual granule cell is a tiny drop in the bucket for a Purkinje cell in terms of excitatory inputs. Whereas a single, there's only one, for each Purkinje cell, there's only one cell in the olive that it gets inputs from, and that one cell makes um, thousands upon thousands of those excitatory connections bonds that one energy cell. So, um, so it's super strong. Um, and so when the olive gets active, that completely shuts down your motor And that's the, that's the sort of catch and reset of an error when, when something bad happens. And an error can be making a typo, um, uh, the example I gave in class is stepping on your partner's foot when you're dancing. Um, an error can be um, uh, you um, you touch something and get an electric shock from it. Um, so uh, so uh, you know the, the, the touching uh, touching an outlet and getting an electric shock. Um, anything like that. It's like okay, whatever you just did, that was wrong. Stop. Reset. Right? Yeah. Is that like kind of like go with the reflex as well? Yeah. So. It starts to depend all of a sudden on your definition of reflex, um, but um, a lot of people do think of the cerebellum as a place where certain kinds of learned reflexes occur. So um, the, um, the eye blink reflex is, I can be, you can train somebody, a person, a cat, whatever, um, that when a certain tone plays to close their eyes. And the way you do that is when a tone plays, within half a second of the tone starting, you puff air on their eyes. Um, and human, rabbit, whatever, will we'll, we'll do that. And then in, in mice and rabbits, we find out that that involves the cerebellum. And so, and so that's, in a sense, a learned reflex. It's, it's unconscious. The person, a rabbit, or whatever, does, before they're even sort of consciously perceiving the tone, they're already closing their eyes. Um, but that's not, so the olive is, is detecting the errors. The prevention is more complicated but it involves um, some uh, long-term depression here. Um, uh, at, the, at probably many granule cell to Purkinje cell synapses, whenever something bad happens, a whole lot of them get their activity weakened. Um, and then that changes whether or not you're going to turn on or off different motor programs under different sensory and cognitive states. Um, and so the error prevention, once you've had errors happen a few times and you want to prevent them in the future, um, involves that. And that is a little bit beyond what we've talked about. There were some research articles that I was hoping to have time to, and I didn't have time to talk about. Okay. Um, 
Um, Jamie, did you have a question a minute ago? Oh, um, yeah. I was going to ask about the um, um, hearing resonance, the sound. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah, sure. So, I think this was something that um, a lot of people ended up not, not getting, um, not, not quite um, catching on the, the exam and, and, uh, and so on, so yeah. Um, so, there's my cochlea, this is the apex, which is where low frequency sounds, and then over here is toward the base where high frequency sounds. Um, and so, if I play a constant sound of 220 hertz, then there's some zone in the cochlea that's perfectly tuned to that 220 hertz, and it starts vibrating and resonating. Um, right next to it, there's a zone that's tuned to 200 hertz, and it's kind of almost resonating, but then it starts getting out of phase with this, and so, and so we get to a point where the, the pushes, it, 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 it's, like, it's like you're almost right at pushing your friend on the swing, but then you start it over, over the course of a minute, all of a sudden you're up again, you're, you're up too far forward, and you're pushing them to the wrong stage in the cycle. Um, and so we really need this nice sort of um, pushing every time thing. Um, th there's this sun zone over here that's maybe 330 hertz. Again, um, that one's going to be... Um, sort of like every other time getting pushed at the wrong point. So that's not going to um, Something over here is maybe 110 hertz. That's like perfectly every other time. And so I'm literally put helping it exactly as often as I'm pushing it against it. So that's not resonating. But up here, there's something that likes to resonate at 440 hertz. And this one gets a little interesting because the cycles of sound pressure waves are coming exactly every other time that it wants to vibrate. And so unlike 110, where, where half of them are pushing in the wrong direction and half of them are pushing in the right direction, they're all pushing in the right direction just half as often. So it's like pushing your friend every other cycle on the swing. Not going to get them going maybe as high as you push every cycle, but you'll still be working with them. Um, and then 660, same thing, you're pushing them every third time. Um, 880 and so on and so forth. If you push them every 20th time, yeah, you'll sort of be in phase, but eventually you're, eventually it's not doing so much good. So the, the low integer multiples especially are going, are going pretty well here. Um, and so, so if this is my sound, then coming into my medial geniculate nucleus, I'm getting activity at the 220 cell, the 440 cell, the 660 cell. Um, and then coming into primary auditory cortex, sort of imagine um, columns within an auditory cortex. Uh, so here's layer four, layer two, three, uh, layer five, which would be subdivided into 5A and 5B, maybe. Anyway, we'll ignore higher order thalamic nuclei, which kind of wrote there, um, and then six. Um, so this is, this would be, say, my 110 zone in primary auditory cortex, 220 zone, um, 330 zone, 440 zone, uh, 550 zone, 660, 770, uh, and so on. So so when, um, when the black is playing, the black tone of 220 is playing, then this zone, this zone, and this zone of auditory cortex are active. And that's a pattern which 
happens when a pure tone of 220 hertz is being played out in the world. Somebody's blowing on a flute that's got a pure 220 tone coming off of it, then this pattern of zones in my auditory cortex gets active. And if the brain is good at anything, it is good at detecting patterns. And this is a reliable pattern that can be caused by a very specific external stimulus of a 220 hertz tone. Beam. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then a 220 hertz activates 220 Yeah. Yeah. From the bottom up, from the cochlea up to the auditory cortex. Um, and then the brain might sort of hypothesize after a little discussion and some, uh, that the brain might actually want to reinforce this tone. And the way the brain might want to reinforce this tone is to have all of these three areas project back to 220. Because that's what that, that 220 is what is out in the world that's causing this. And so we want to reinforce that perception. Um, I'm going to need, I'm going to need one more zone of auditory cortex to, to sort of continue on the discussion. Layer two, three. Four, five, or six. In eight eighties, maybe weakly activated by my pure two twenty. It's a fourth overtone, third over third overtone. So it's it's it's, 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 it's um, every fourth cycle. Okay, does that make sense so far? Okay. Then I come along and I play this. Something that goes on in four and four hertz. Now, just like my 110 zone didn't get, didn't get activated by the 220, when I play for a 40, two, the 220 zone of my cochlea is not getting active, right? A 80 zone is, 440 zone is by definition, 880 zone is for the same reason 440 did with 220, right? And then maybe um, uh, uh, whatever is this is going to be um, 13, 1320, I think. 1320 also. Um, so when a 440 hertz sound is playing, that activates this 440 and the 880 and maybe the 1320 zone of my cochlea and the corresponding zones of my MGN. And so when a 440 hertz soft tone is playing, this is active and this is active, but 660 is not, 220 is not. Right. And so I should perceive that as similar to 220 because there's some similarity, but also as a higher pitch. And in fact, it would be perceived as an A an octave higher, and that's what the definition of an octave is. Um, so it would be still perceived as an A note, but now it's one octave higher than the last one. Does that make sense so far? <clears throat> okay, so then I come along and I play a 660 hertz sound. And so that 660 hertz sound activates here and here. And so here and here, and so here and wherever 1320 is, or whatever being activated by that. Um, that's again gonna have some similarities. It's called a perfect fifth, I think. Scritchy, did I get that right? I think so. I think so. This is where my music knowledge is lost. <laughs> <laughs> get to pick on pick on the, the people I know who do who, who have done more music than I have. Um, so, but but um, it's some it's it's a, it's it's not an even integer or not a power of two multiple, but whatever. Anyway, so so six sixty again doesn't activate four forty doesn't activate two twenty. Where life gets interesting is if I simultaneously play both of these together, four forty and six sixty. So 440 and 660 together. When I do that, 
440 gets activated because that's part of what's being played. 660 gets activated because that's part of what's being played. 880 gets activated because that's an overtone of 440. And 1320 is also going to get activated because it happens to be an overtone of both. And so what's going to happen then is over here, um, 440 gets active, 660 gets active, and 880 gets active in my auditory. Everyone good with that so far? Okay, and so I just said a little while ago, brain is a pattern recognition device. That is maybe its most fundamental feature. And so your brain says, ah, a pattern. This is the, this, these are the areas that get activated when a pure 220 hertz tone is being played. Um, and in fact, in the video that we showed in class, what she did was she showed that if you're playing 440 and 660 together, it sounds like a 220 hertz sound tone is being played. Even though there's no 220 hertz tone present, this area of the cochlea is not resonating, but your brain says, it's almost there. We've got almost the complete pattern. We're just missing this one little thing, which happens to be the bass tone. And so, and so then because of this feedback that is designed to reinforce the pattern, we actually end up detecting something that wasn't there at all, which is a 220 hertz tone. So, yeah, that ends up being, I think that was more complicated than I really spent time unpacking in class, which is part of the reason why a lot of people um, struggled with it, but um, hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, so what questions do you have? Yeah. So when you activate like, a certain frequency, it only resonates at higher yeah, yeah, um, uh, it's, it's the sort of, because this wants to be pushed 440 times a second. If I'm coming and pushing 220 times a second, then, um, uh, then that's um, hitting it, then I'm hitting it, if I line these up better, um, one peak would be right on, yeah, I almost got it. Every, every other peak is right on, and so, and so I'm hitting it every other time that it wants to go. Yeah. In the auditory cortex, if 440 and 660 being activated, then 1320 is not being. Uh, probably yeah, 1320 is yeah yeah. Um, most of, but but the sort of thing yeah I sort of ran out of space yeah 13 say 880 would uh, yeah 880 would be, um, and so most of, but but um, the first three overtones of 220 are all active, uh -huh. and 220 isn't, and so your brain's like that's almost exact me. And so I think of it as your brain maybe saying, well, maybe I just missed the bass tone, but it's really there. Um, but you're sort of filling in the gap in the pattern. Um, there are other examples, I don't remember if I showed this in class or not, um, of, your, of the, way your brain, uh, the way your brain can fill in gaps in patterns. Um, 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 but there are other ways that, that your brain can fill in gaps. Um, oh, yeah, this is this is it. Did I did, did I show this in class? Did I show those in class? All right. Well, since everyone's been here for an hour and fifteen minutes, we'll take a little break and do an activity. What what are those pictures of? You can. By the way, if, if, if people can't sleep, whatever. Any ideas? What the heck those are pictures of? There's two pictures. There. Elephant. Your elephant. <laughs> Uh, which one? On the left. <laughs> the one on the left is an elephant. Okay. Um, so, any any thoughts about what we've got there? Still kind of a mess. So, how we feel about elephant now? You like, you like the elephant, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty good. Um, any ideas about what's on the right? Umbrella. Yeah, yeah, umbrella. Okay. So, um, so your brain fills in the missing gaps, and actually the, and so um, it's. A little bit unclear where this happens, probably in like V3 or V4, actually V4, or probably V2 or V4. But, um, but your brain fills in missing gaps. And just like this, we're filling in the gap. In this case, the gap is the 220 hertz activation. We're filling that in. In this case, the gap is these sort of erased parts of the line. Um, and actually, there's some learning that can go on with this too. Um, and probably in your life, 
you have heard a lot of different tones, and you have learned that overtones tend to get activated in your cochlea along with tones. So you've learned things. Um, sometimes people say, if you, if you remember nothing else from this class, you will remember this. Well, I can guarantee you that, honestly, if you remember nothing else from this class, you will remember this, because if five years from now, somebody comes up to you with that, you, you'll have a really darn good chance of guessing elephant and umbrella. You might not even remember why you're guessing elephant and umbrella, but you'll guess elephant and umbrella, and for sure if you get that much, you'll be elephant and umbrella for sure, it's so obvious, how can you not see that? Um, so, uh, so yeah, your, your, um, uh, your sensory systems are learning to fill in gaps all the time, and, and figuring out what patterns naturally occur in the world, or, or often occur in your sensory world. There's another one, does anyone ever, actually, my favorite is this. No, you even see what that is? The dog, have you seen it before? Yeah. So again, like if you, if you don't, it took me forever, it took me literally like 30 minutes, but here's the dog's head, and legs, here's its backside, its other leg, its other leg, it's on the floor. Um, there's also a cat hidden in here, I'll leave that up until somebody asks some other question, you can hopefully hear out about cats. But, um, but with, uh, that one's actually less of a perfect illustration of this. This is a great, illustration of this, and these are sort of textbook illustrations of this. Um, but but these, these ability to detect patterns in the world um, are things that your brain is constantly doing, constantly refining. But anyway, that was a pattern that's nearly too deep, but just not the Yeah, other questions people have? Anybody see the cat by now? It's sort of it's 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 sort of in this quadrant here. <laughs> anyway, you can ask a question. Yeah, sure. Oh, you wanted to pick up your exam? Can, you have to. Can you wait until everyone else is done. Other questions about other stuff? Yeah, sure. So when you say like reference an article in the in the test answers, like so, just refer to like what it was about. Well, I mean, it's, I guess what I meant by that is, um, for a lot of, for, for many, maybe half the things we talked about in this class, you've seen data to back up assertions like, um, uh, you know, olfactory coding is sparse um, in the, or olfactory cortex, a combinatorial in the, in the olfactory. And so, if you on, on a lot of the midterms, if you just said that in the context of a lot of those short essay questions, that would be all that you would really need to answer some sorts of questions. But on the final, um, if you're going to make a claim like that, where we've seen the data for it, then you should discuss briefly what the experiment is behind the claim that you're making. Um, and not just like it was in a you know not just it was in a slide that we saw and there's a bullet point on the on the um, on the topics guide but actually we we saw in this class data about this point that I am making in my essay uh, and and this is the particular experiment that is behind that point that I'm making in my essay um, for um, there will be a lot of facts that you're going to draw on, not all of which you've got data for, but, um, and that's why I sort of said that you should be expecting, at for every answer, to be referring to at least two different research articles um, about, um, that, that, sort of, that sort of provide evidence for the claims that you're, that you're making in your essays. Okay. Does that yeah. answer that? Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, well, I'll stick around for a while. Actually, my other class has a review starting at 9, so I get to do this all over again. Yeah, Can you kind of briefly go over again that paper when they rewind the visual connection to A1 in carrots? Is that the result from that? Yeah, um, yes. So, uh, I'll just find the, I'll just find the actual paper. Um, well, 
I guess, I mean, the, the main message from that is that it provides evidence that um, the structure of connections within an area of cortex is determined by the kinds of sensory information coming in. Um, so let's see if I can find. Probably be somewhere in the remote sensors. Um, well, whatever. Okay, so you got a, a ferret's brain, and a ferret's got an eye, and a ferret's got a thalamus with um, an LGN, and an MGN, and then MGN projects to A1, and LGN projects to B1. And the eye, of course, projects into LGN. And then um, coming up from ears, you have a series of connections in the brain stem, ultimately coming to an area called the inferior colliculus, um, and then the inferior colliculus is what projects up to the LG, to the MG. So, if you take a little um, uh, uh, fetal ferret before it's even born, um, and uh, you actually, actually the way to do this is to literally remove it from mom, do the surgery on the animal brain, and then put it back into mom. Um, so, destroy the inferior colliculus. Then what happens is now, and I think they also destroy the superior colliculus, um, because remember that um, normally the retina projects to LG and the superior colliculus. Actually, I think I, yeah, I've done that. They destroy the superior colliculus. And so now, and then they also like lesion some of the lower auditory uh, areas. And so what happens is now the, ret the retina makes a projection into the inferior colliculus. So now all of a sudden, instead, and then the inferior colliculus still affects the NGO, still affects the auditory cortex. So now what you've got is you've got an animal that is getting visual input coming into its auditory cortex as well as visual input coming into its visual cortex. And so there's sort of two competing ideas here. One idea is, well, maybe the, maybe the, well, okay, and then, um, this is where I'm going to the paper, so I'm going to the paper. I do know where I can find that, even if I can't find the slides that I've used. So over here, um, over here, over here. There we go. Normal auditory cortex, you have a few overtones worth of space that you need to connect up, but there's not connectivity across the whole auditory cortex. Um, you just sort of, any, any particular area is going to be just connected up with a few overtones and undertones, getting input from the undertones. and the, or input from the overtones, making output to the undertones, um, and so uh, and so there's sort of a, a not not such an extent to which axons spread out in auditory cortex. Normal, normal visual cortex, on the other hand, um, an object, a visual object, could take up a large fraction of your visual field, and especially if you're looking at it in your fovea, then it can take up half of your visual cortex. Could be you know, something that's, I don't know, something that's the size of this for you that far away in the room could be a third of your visual cortex or something, uh, if, that, if that's what you're focusing your focus on. So your visual cortex makes these really long axons. And so one feature that they looked at with this is um, when you mess up the ferret in this way, do they, do their auditory cortexes follow a predetermined auditory-like development, which is the sort of nature or innate wiring hypothesis, or does the pattern of input 
dictate the way the cells wire up, which is the sort of nurture or experience dependent wiring of the brain. And what they find is that the rewired auditory cortex, um, in terms of its connectivity, looks a lot like primary visual cortex. And in fact, you even find um, cells that are selective for, um, for lines of different orientation in this rewired auditory cortex. And the arrangement of the way these orientation selective cells organize themselves in the rewired auditory cortex matches very closely with what you find in visual cortex. Um, and so, um, uh, and in fact, they even did another set of experiments that was even slightly more complicated, where they tried, where they provided evidence that um, when the rewired auditory cortex is activated, the animal behaves as if it has seen something rather than heard something. Um, and so, um, and so that's kind of the, the, the bottom line of that, I guess. Um, for this paper, as with most of the ones that we've talked about throughout the semester, um, like I said in one of my more recent emails from just about 30 minutes before this uh, review session started, um, I'm going to post all the papers together from the whole semester into like one zip file that I'll put up on Blackboard. Um, and then um, what you need to know about them is basically what's summarized in the topic set, like the experimental manipulation, the particular measurement that we discussed in class, the results of that particular measurement, and what that particular measurement provided in terms of interpretation. Um, so, um, so I'm going to put all the papers up so that you can organize them and have them all together, um, along with the topics guide, which has this sort of five-line summary of each paper um, up on Blackboard, uh, probably tomorrow morning. Um, but for this one, yeah, that's sort of what you need. Is the, is the they they met somehow through some some craziness got visual information into what should be auditory cortex, and then. The connectivity patterns in that rewired auditory cortex start looking a lot like normal visual cortex. And so the interpretation, therefore, is that what determines the, the spread of connectivity and the way the cells organize themselves is not some innate program for a particular area, but rather the patterns of sensory inputs coming into that area. Does that help? That was kind of yeah, a quick so summary at the end there. So then, like, in the context of, I think, the other people that came with this as part of the blog assignment about HP, HSP90, which like seems to be like arguing at least for like- Ah, uh, right, 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 yeah, like, yeah. Determined. So is it just like the visual cortex follows in the predetermined path and then this one is more- Yeah, well, no, that, I, I think that um, the way I, what I would say is that this is um, an unresolved question. Um, so, and actually that reminder, maybe I can, um, no, this is, yeah, I don't know. Um, it, it, anyway, um, <clears throat> so that other paper provides an argument that the visual system is predetermined to have these left eye, right eye, or things. And there's a gene that we can find that, um, that is present on the, where the ipsilateral eye is going to land and not present where the contralateral eye is going to land. And so that argues for a predetermined wiring system, which is exactly the opposite interpretation. Um, and so, in fact, that is why, or the, that is a sampling of the many studies out there which some of which argue for innate wiring of sensory areas based on genetic predetermination, and, and this can then maybe be modified later by experience, but it's originally set up by, by something innate. Um, and others that say, no, it's, there is no innate wiring, it's all, um, it's all about the pattern of activity. And so this rewired ferret one is on the, it's all about the pattern of activity side of things, the HSP 90s is all about the innate wiring. Um, there is no final answer. There are pieces of data that point to either direction um, and conflicting interpretations that are out there. Um, and that would be a great question to ask is like, you know, do you think that cortical areas are predetermined or not? 
um, explain your reasons why, explain um, some evidence for and against this, and then for the thing that you disagree with, explain why you don't think it's as compelling as the thing you agree with, for example. Um, and so that's sort of a, a chance, that, that, that would be um, the kind of question that you can easily see on the plan level say, uh, is, is that there are maybe um, unresolved scientific questions with theories that have um, data that point in opposite directions. I'm staying here as long as, now I'm staying here for another two hours anyway. <laughs> Yeah, well, it works for me because I can uh, mostly get the kids in bed before I come over here, and so um, it doesn't leave my wife with a bunch of uh, like hours and hours of having to deal with two, two kids. That's fair. <laughs> but yeah, I'll see you uh, Thursday, Tuesday morning is the same. 8.30, yeah. All right, have, have a good couple of days. Thank you, you too.